Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Elder Empire, C, Book 3 of Kings and Killers. Chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. Four chapters this episode. We're doing a lot. And at the end of this section of chapters, we get a flashback to something that happened with Foster. I really hated this. I hated this so much. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Asher for commissioning this episode. Asher is here in the chat hanging out with me. Hurrah. Um, so, okay, I'm just going to start and, and like, I'm going to get to Foster. I want to leave a good amount of time for that because I have a lot of questions, but uh, I won't start there. I'm going to resist this. So... We have a, uh, Asher says, lady, you got to let me know if I need to add another episode. This seems like a lot. This one, no, this was actually, the chapters were just very short, Asher. Um, I broke this book down and it was like 40 pages per episode, 45, I think, max. It, the overall breakdown for this did not wind up with the big, like kind of oversized chunks that the previous book did because... I actually did it ahead of time instead of waiting till I was halfway through the book, which is what I should be doing all the time. Um, so yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, okay. So the thing is a lot of this, I can kind of fly through because it's a, like all the assassination attempt by Shara. And I will be perfectly honest. It is a lot more interesting from Shara's perspective from Calder's perspective, it's a lot of waiting and hesitation and hearing things secondhand. He doesn't actually get involved in what's going on until Shara busts into the room with him. Otherwise, he's out giving the speech, his body double is murdered, and he's told about it later. Um... And I can't help but laugh at the fact that, like, that maid was in on it, but it's just done so well that they assume, A, that the maid was also a victim, and B, that there's, like, four gardeners here, when we know it's only Shara, but she does have some accomplices. It's not exactly just, just Shara. Nevertheless, they really do not still get what she's capable of. Um, so Asher says, I read this one first, so it was a lot more interesting for me, I think. And I think Shara's perspective was more satisfying as a result. Yeah, I think that's going, like, the, it, it's the same thing for me as the uh, the meeting with the guild heads. Being in Shara's perspective was more fascinating for me with that as well. And that's not to say that, like, there's no value to seeing it from caller's perspective perspective, but I do feel like it could have been that it's, this is the danger, right? I know that these books are meant to be read both sets of three, but what will I'm sure wants to be able to happen is that you could read one trilogy to completion as a whole without having to jump back and forth from perspectives and go between each set of books. And if you want that to be doable, you can't just like kind of hand wave this, you know? But like I said, he isn't really hugely involved with a lot of it until like later on. So it's a tricky thing where Will has to balance making sure he includes enough that it feels like a complete telling without dragging. And I think that's probably pretty hard. Uh, it's like he's really managed that quite well. 
I think these last three books suffer the most in terms of being an overlapping story because they have so many major moments where they are in the same room together. And objectively, in those same moments, they're each experiencing a similar the, – the events that are happening and as they are told to us are pretty much identical. The only things that are different are the way they each see one another and their motivations, which we already know. And it's not really us getting any particularly new information. Even when we're with Calder in his uh, guild meeting scene, I kind of thought we were going to get a little bit more of of his like – and. We just, you know, and that's because they're both actually fairly reasonable people who want the same things in a general sense. So I just think that the first two books lend themselves to this a lot more simply because they are apart and they get together for these like big showdowns at the end of each book where they're like a confrontation. But in this book, they have to work together a few major times. So... That winds up being sort of, it's the flashbacks in this one that actually have wound up being the most different. And it's kind of funny because I was saying how I was a little frustrated by continuing to do the flashbacks at this point. But with once I start this book, I'm taking that back a little bit because the flashbacks are was keeping it from feeling too repetitive. Um, It is still a little bit confusing, but, you know, it's fine. So... Uh, Asher says, it did get a little, let me reintroduce you to the characters and context, E, like when you get sequels. Yeah. Um, and like I said, this is a really tricky thing to do. So I get how this would happen, but I don't know, maybe just write the books into each other so that it's one long trilogy instead of two separate trilogies. And then you wouldn't have to worry about this quite so much. I'm just saying, Will. Um, so Evil says, if you judge the books by Calder and Shara, I like Calder's books best. However, I like the Regents and Teach's story a lot. And that was part of Shara. Yeah, I have kind of, um, I'm all over the place, to be honest. I like Calder's story because the, ensemble cast is so uh, what I like I think is that they seem like a crew that's really working together whereas Shara is she has only Lucan and Maya who feel like they're at all really on her side and then there's like Carrion who's certainly a good person but she's not part of her team and Shara is a lot more isolated and that is not as much fun to read and that's just sort of how that goes, you know? Um, Asher says, I'm on the other side. I like Shara's books best. I don't, I just don't really like Calder all that much. I'll be honest. Calder's my least favorite part of Calder's books. No offense, Calder. I think he's like a decent person, but he's not super interesting. And the only thing that I kind of enjoy about him is that he is a little bit dopey and just genuinely doesn't seem to know what's coming at him. And, I, th- that's like simultaneously funny, but also a little frustrating. Um, yeah. Evil says Shara is kind of like Simon Calder has a team like Lyndon. Uh, that's sort of what I was thinking as well. I wonder if like after writing these two, Will was like, you know, having a big team is actually way more fun to write about. Maybe I'll start doing something with that. Um, and it would also explain why I don't really care for the, uh, the Traveler's Gate books as much because people who work on their own, especially when they take themselves pretty seriously, uh, eh, you know? Um, so anyway, he's giving his speech, wondering whether or not the, uh, gardeners are going to come at him tonight. And this is the point where he, people are like screaming at him about how he is an elder worshiper and stuff. And there was a scene a while back where I was like, I thought that they were less happy with him. And I think I was just remembering the wrong moment because this is the thing that I was recalling. And we had seen this from Shara's perspective, how the crowd just was like, they, he winds up sort of winning them over, but initially they are not pleased to see him. Um, And eventually he hears this like shout from inside the palace 
And the guards try and pull him away and he doesn't move, even though he can understand why they're starting to get worried. He pulls out the awakened padlock and he uses it to lock the entire place down. And he's like kind of surprised that the consultants took the bait this fast. He really didn't expect it to work so quickly. And again, he, they didn't get your message. I'm not sure if that would like influence why, why he thinks they would wait. But regardless, he ends his speech here with, I've, uh, you know, I've seen Elder Spawn. In my youth, I worked for the Black Watch. Ever since then, I've sailed the Aeon, and I've seen things that put to shame the brightest dreams and darkest nightmares. If you've seen what I had seen, then you too would keep fighting to keep the Empire whole, no matter what stood in your way. The last line came out grimmer than he had intended, and the noise from the crowd dipped a little. But he was done with them. So this is when he's led inside and somebody tells him that his double is dead. And he's like fucked up over this. He didn't expect it to bother him as much as it does. But honestly, I would be haunted by this for the rest of my life. You know, if it, because it, it's not only was this person pretending to be you and they were murdered because somebody wanted you dead that badly, but it was his decision to, to give the speech instead and have his double stay behind. Changing up the whole bit was solely Calder's plan. And I just, I, I do think it's interesting here. One of the guards tells him your double is dead. And Calder switches up the plan with the double without speaking. He writes it all down because he's worried that somebody is going to hear. But he, it turns out the guards know this is actually Calder. I wasn't entirely sure if that was going to be the case. I thought maybe they were going to think they were escorting the double out there. And uh, once this you know, begins to pop off. I'm like, oh, they realize he switched the plan. And I guess they didn't resist that at all. I wonder how he, he must've written it down for them as well. Um, so he puts on the emperor's armor and, uh, you know, he's getting filled in on exactly how all this happened. And he sees that his double has his throat slit. And he's like, why would they have done that? If they got him, with a with a blade from like far away why come all the way in the room and we know it's because Shara suspected that wasn't him she's just like mm, this, this was too easy so at this point one of the guards says you've locked yourself in a building with a team of gardeners and he says, no, I've locked them in here with us, which is a line that we've heard before somewhere, but like in a pop culture thing, I don't recall though. What I find so funny is again, it's not a team. It's just Shara. And also I know that he wants to sound badass and like confident. And he really tries later as well regarding like the champions but man, Calder is doing his best. That's really all I can say. And this is such a sad thing. Like, I really feel like you're doing your best is exclusively used as an insult nowadays. I don't mean it to be an insult. It just kind of winds up being an insult because it implies that you're not capable of better and this is obviously not great. So you are incompetent. But when I say doing his best, I, I don't mean to just be insulting. I mean, he doesn't know really how to rule or <sighs> inspire. You know, the people that are on his crew were looking to Andal for all of their instructions and all of their orders, because Andal was really technically in charge, right up until a great elder basically was like, oh, he's going to be emperor one day. 
And it was solely by this like implication from the outside that they started to see him differently and like listen to him. And he's just really like, I, I, I want to know what happens. Does he stay in this position? Like what? I just, I, he needs, he's got to figure it out. He's <laughs> to, to quote Donald Glover in a scene in one of the Spider-Man movies. You need to get better at this part of the job. <laughs> I know you're trying and he does have a moment of insight that he can he can understand the emotions of men better than the uh, emperor had been able to because he's like just more connected with being a fucking human being. Um, but it's just still not great. Um, so <laughs> Asher says they're doing their best equals bless their heart. It's sort of true. And I, again, I don't mean it to be, but it winds up being that anyway um so let's see sorry evil is hearkening back to uh traveler's gate which i don't want to get into too much simon was irritated by how much alan took himself so seriously tg picks up at the end as a team is formed will ends to continue tg oh will intends to continue tg and has a good foundation of characters to grow off even if the team vibe is not there yet uh all right I don't, I'll be honest. I don't care. I don't, I just didn't really care about it. It just didn't. I, I am midway through the third book and I have been, it's been months and I haven't picked it up again. Cause I just truly, it didn't get, it didn't nothing, nothing. I'm sorry. Um, so he realizes finally that Shara is here. And it's again this moment of like he was ready for her. He stood with his sword drawn, waiting for Shara and her team to come through the door. And he eventually just sits down and the guards are around him and he takes his helmet off. And we know like this is when Shara spots him. She uses the mist to see where he is. And she spots him like sitting with his guards, with his helmet off, talking and laughing with them. So this is a moment where he it's he's thinking that he was worried Shara would be killed or captured without him there to see it, which is an unusually petty moment for Calder. Not to say that he hasn't been petty, but it's always been like in a way that felt petty on a much smaller scale. This is petty about somebody who's committed murder against people that you care about. That's a different kind of petty. Um, it, it shouldn't matter, but this was the woman who had kidnapped Jerry, killed Urzaya, and repeatedly tried to kill him. She had even pretended to be willing to work with him only to drop that resolve instantly, which we know she actually was willing to work with him. That's not to say that she was ever going to commit. She's always prepared with a back door to get out. But she meant what she said and feels the exact same way about him, which is so annoying. So finally, all these guards start talking about how the champions couldn't save themselves from the consultants. And this is when he does the listen to me and they do, which he like takes him off guard a little. And he has to sort of be like, all right, I guess they're listening. I better make this good. We know the consultants did it. There are so many rumors about them, but they had to kill champions in their sleep. Or bomb them when they went to relieve themselves. You think they could touch champions on a battlefield? And they shake their heads and I'm just like, yeah, but they did fucking kill Urzaya. He's just leaving this out and he should. There is no reason to bring it up. But it feels almost like he's lying to himself a little bit in this scene. Um, he says something about a squad of cowardly assassins who have never held a sword in their lives. And I'm like again and somebody does cut in and he just is like it's a figure of speech and i'm like mm, yeah it's inaccurate though um i'm putting all my money and my life itself in the hands of the champions and i'm like mm, that's literally all you can do i get it but and then and the imperial guard what do a bunch of spies have on you huh and he's just again he's really trying but it's not actually anything and uh 
<laughs> so then we get the door opening and it's fucking Shara. He realizes that the helmet is on the floor in the mist and he genuinely doesn't even see it. Can't find it for a second. He is able to get it on just before she like swings at him with her knife, but it is a very close call. Um, and then she gets gripped by Tyria's power, her soulbound power, this like vine thing and yanks her back. And he has this, she couldn't break the emperor's armor. He was safe now, but she wasn't. And I want Calder, and this is not actually something that he needs to worry about, but I want him to think about it. Calder, does he know Shara is the one who killed the emperor? Is he aware it was her? Because if he is, and he's wearing the emperor's armor, and he still thinks he's safe from Shara... I just want him to just consider that a little bit. Not to say that, that they are actually relevant, but I, I'm i just saying, as somebody with anxiety, being so certain you are safe now is never a, a way to behave. You just don't want to speak in absolutes that let you grow complacent. It's just a bad call. So, of course, fucking Rosifus is out here. Face me, snake. And I really appreciate how Calder says to Tyria, has that ever worked? I've never fought with Rosifus before, Tyria said. But I can say with confidence that no, it never has. Bless them. Um, and later on, Rosifus is like, ah, cockroach can't move when it's pinned to a board. And everybody's just like, oh, guy. Tyria's like, is she a cockroach or is she a snake? You're going to have to pick one. Nobody is here for his grandstanding. It's delightful. Um, so fight, 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 fight. And a lot more mist again. And it doesn't seem like he realizes the mist is Shara's. Like that she, that when it's growing denser, this is something that he should worry about. In other words, um, he sees bloody footprints on the ground and has been sort of sent off to get out while the two um, champions are trying to track her down. And they're going to essentially distract her and buy him some time so that he can escape. But then he sees her crouching in a corner and he decides that he's going to approach her instead of just like summoning help and backing off. And this is the moment where she suggests that they fight again and expects him to be goaded and take her up on this and is genuinely surprised when Calder reacts with like, I'm not doing that. That's not what this is about. It's not my pride. And she's sort of, she's genuinely a little, I think impressed at the maturity of the moment. I do appreciate that he, one, isn't going to risk himself, but two, also we get the guard could hear him, so he had to make sure he took the moral high ground. I am never, ever going to shit talk doing the right thing because somebody is there. I know that it's not as valuable as doing the right thing when there's nobody there. But it's the first step to really having some self-awareness is realizing what it's going to look like to the people around you. And all you have to do from there, once you start to like have that kind of awareness is anytime you are alone, think about what people would say if they knew what you were about to do. And my motto at this point in my life is whenever you do anything, eventually somebody is going to find out about it. I don't know if that's necessarily really true, but things come out eventually. Most of the time, secrets don't stay secret unless they genuinely are only yours and there's nobody else involved at all. So I just think it's a good practice to always behave as if folks are going to find out and you don't have to worry about what the entire world thinks 
just there's going to be a few people in your life whose opinions genuinely matter to you. And what would they think? And if that's what it takes, that's fine. Sometimes if you don't know what the right thing to do is, thinking about it from the perspective of friends that you respect can help you sort through what the right thing to do is. So all this to say, I don't want him to be just doing this because there's somebody hearing him. But I also appreciate that he is like noticing that and taking that into account at all. Um, so at first he's like, he calls over the champions and he's thinking that they can grab her and then says there's something strange about her intent. And he reaches out to her and takes his gauntlet off. He's still far enough away that she can't get to him, but he's feeling something weird. And then he sees Siphon and is like, oh, fuck. And I guess that what he was feeling was her switching to Siphon from Bastion. Like, is, was that what he, what she calls the other blade? Um, but yeah, he yells for them to take her now. And Shara cuts right through everything that is thrown at her. And he is just like, God damn it. I just, he genuinely is not prepared for what Shara is able to do now. Um, so then he's like, okay, just kill her with which Rosifus is 100% down to do. But again, this isn't going the same way that he was expecting. Uh, by the time Calder processed what had happened, he had already come to one conclusion. Time to go. Shara was apparently a double soulbound with the strength to deflect a champion's blade. He officially no longer had the qualification to participate in this fight. I love that line. I really love that line. It's, you know, you could say he went to run and hide. I mean, yeah, I guess. But honestly, that's a very logical way to look at it. And he is correct. Um, so... She disappears into the mist again. Uh, one of the guards is like, where'd she go? And Calder's like, I don't give a fuck. We are getting out of here. And Calder is thinking they have her and they're distracting her again. And then he hears they've lost her. And he looks around as the guards are pulled into the fucking fog around them. Uh, the last guard was pulled into Bastion's veil as well. There was a look of horror on her wide cat-like eyes. He shoved his orange glowing sword. Uh, he shoved out his orange glowing sword, his heart hammering in his chest. She's here. He shouted where Rosifus roared. And it sounded like his voice was coming from everywhere at once. Shara materialized in front of him, looking like the gray phantom of death with a blue blade in one hand and green in the other. He could see nothing of her face beneath the hood. She was an inhuman specter here to claim his soul. And I was just like, this bitch is scary. Good for her. Um, there were some who believed in a certain type of elder spawn that showed itself only to the dying a moment before death. If it were real, it would look like Shara of the gardeners. And she asks, where's your wife? You want to know? Defeat me and I'll tell you. I'm not here to defeat you, her voice said. And poor Calder is genuinely ready to piss himself at this point. He is freaking out. She stabs him in the back. He had been stabbed before, and there was no way to prepare for the pain. On top of the unspeakable pain, he felt something draining from him, as though the dagger were drinking his blood through a straw. She had stabbed straight through the Emperor's armor. How? And this is when she says, All hail the Emperor of the world. And this is when Calder is like, oh, you motherfucker. When Shara says it in her book, I was aware of what was happening in that moment. 
but it did not hit for me because I knew in his head it was going to be so much more dramatic when she said this. So I was just like, oh, I can't wait to read this from Calder's perspective. It wasn't really even like, I, I basically was like, oh, we're putting a pin in that because I, Shara doesn't know what she's saying when she says it, you know, this is just what she's saying in the spur of the moment. But uh, we know how significant this is to him. And yet being in his head was less dramatic on that front than I expected. I thought it was going to be more of like a feeling of rage coming from him that he was sort of misled. Sort of is really mild. He was hugely misled. But no, it seems like he's actually just resigned in this moment. And also he thinks of Jerry and has to make some effort to steer his mind away from her because he recognizes she just doesn't deserve to be the last thing he thinks about. And the fact that he tells that to himself, I think is pretty huge. Like we know that he has moved on past things with her at this point in most ways that matter. But in a moment of death, I think that's really going to tell you the truth about what your priorities are and him thinking of her because of just reflex and habit and then consciously pushing that away and being like, no, now I need to think about the people who have mattered to me and stayed faithful and are in my life. And that is very important. And I really just, it was very touching this. I'm going to read this. He chose to remember the sun on his face and the pitching deck beneath his feet. Petal, presenting an experimental draft to him as her hands trembled with doubt. Andal adjusting his hat as he pricked at Calder's ego. Foster shouting with his head halfway up a cannon. Urziah's laughter echoing over the ocean. Shuffles fluttering down to land on his shoulder. And though he resisted it, even Jerry, slipping her arm into his and looking with him out over a strange and magical sea. I really liked this a lot. And there's something so poignant to me about the moments that are selected here. It's not big moments in his life. It's not big moments of their valor or, you know, it's ordinary everyday shit. And I don't know, I'm going to make a reference here. Those of you who uh, have seen it will know, but everything everywhere all at once um, has a sort of through line of w wanting more from your life and expecting more and thinking that you were probably capable of more and then going through all of these different versions of the world and versions of yourself to sort of wind up thinking actually maybe the version of me that isn't super great at a lot of stuff or isn't living this like wildly successful life maybe it's okay after all that I just do this and one of the more moving moments was when somebody who she is actually like with, she meets them in another version of reality. And he says, well, I think I would have really liked doing laundry and taxes with you. And her saying that that's like their life. She's saying it in this very derogatory way. Which, I mean, it's laundry and it's taxes. Like, I'm not mad at her. But when he says that back, there's a sense of elevation to it. And, oh, maybe that matters. And that is something I really struggle with. I try to, like, make moments sometimes. And in trying, rob myself of the experiencing of that moment because I am too focused on a thing I am attempting to accomplish rather than just being with the people that I have around me. And 
it is a very tricky thing, but these moments of each of them, I mean, it's, he's not thinking about Urziah fighting. He's thinking about him laughing. He's thinking about Petal doing something that she loves and like checking in with him and wondering what he thinks. He's thinking about Foster, just his head halfway up a cannon because he's just probably like doing maintenance and that's always the shit he's doing. It's all just maintenance stuff, the daily bullshit. And that fucking seems like the right thing, you know? So this is when we go to Tyria's POV and she feels that he has no pulse. And she is just like, God damn it. Um, she couldn't leave his awakened weapon or the emperor's armor to the independents, and she was sure they were coming. They wouldn't send their guild head in alone, no matter how many insane soulbound powers she had. They did, though. Right? It was just Shara, unless I'm mistaken. But I feel like it... I mean, it's not again, not to say that there weren't people around, but, like, nobody goes in after she has completed this. Do they? Anyway, we go back to chapter 15 here. And they're on the Lyathaton. Uh, this is three years ago. And they have managed to, like, get out of there. And he's thinking over everything that's happened. And the fact that, like, the exact certain people who were injured and died feels a little bit suspicious. And this is when he says, are we working for the elders? It's Jerry. And she says, it depends what you mean. Um, and he says, I wonder if Akmagu is just pushing me where he wants me to go. He's playing the music and I'm dancing. I don't want to survive just because an elder likes me best. He hadn't liked Thomason. He hadn't even known Thomason, really. But the idea that Calder had only lived because he met the preferences of a great elder, that felt wrong. And this is when she says, I feel like I let you down. And I think this is 100% Jerry realizing that they're straying a little bit too far into territory that might make Calder uncooperative. And she's just changing the subject. And it works. Because any time that she sort of appeals to him being concerned about her feelings, he is a fucking sucker. Like, and I don't, I say sucker in a way that sounds mean, but I mean, this is what it means to care about somebody. You know, if you really care about someone and they express to you that they are feeling badly about something, it should distract you. That's like what it means to give a shit about a person. So I, when I say a sucker, I don't really mean, oh, what a doof. How can you not see it in this moment? I do mean that in a general sense, because there are so many other pieces of evidence that Calder is just really not seeing. But in this moment, I feel like that's exactly what's happening. And I just hate, I just hate how little effort it really seems to take, you know? Um, so then we go to Cheska and Calder, I had forgotten. He says something to Jerry about how, like, depending on how much how much we make for this deal, and I'm like, how much you make? You got the you got the crown though. And then I was like, oh my god, he doesn't give them the crown. I know that he walks around with that thing. We know he doesn't give it to anybody. So I'm over here like, oh sweet, he's gonna pay off his debt because I've completely lost the thread, and he tells Cheska he doesn't have it and she is not an idiot and she knows that he fucking does. However, the only thing that she's actually worried about is whether or not they just straight up murdered the entire other crew because that's what it looks like. And Calder is even like, yeah, if I were in her shoes, I would 100% think that happened. Like it's just uncanny which is part of where his questions were coming from when he talked to jerry so he says i don't know how we made it out and they didn't i don't know how we made it out at all and he means it when he says it and she can tell 
Um, and again, he doesn't know how they made it out at all because he thinks maybe it was like elders responsible for that. And <laughs> I love this moment. Um, he, she, Varia, who really hates him and is like the, the right hand of Cheska says he's clean. We disposed of the body. It was a mess. If it wasn't elder work, there's no telling it now. Hear that, Captain Martin? You checked out clean as a whistle. I am pleased to hear that my record is as clean as my conscience, which really is very good. Very good line. I do wish I knew who walked off with my prize, she said, giving him an overly obvious wink that Varia immediately noticed. I'd put in a bid myself. I do have quite a collection already, you know. So then we go to chapter 16 and we go to Petal, who is in this room with the Champions Guild. She's been working with them and they bring in Calder's body. And when she hears what's happening, she kind of dissociates. There is a moment where she's coming toward him and then she sees that he is breathing. And I really enjoy she has had this encounter with a very young girl named Lotta, who seems to have the same temperament as Petal, just extremely anxious, um, awkward socially, and afraid of people in general. And just like, there's just an edge to her that feels very much like Petal, which is what is making Petal sort of reach out. You know, she clearly sees herself in this little girl. And she doesn't, Petal doesn't usually like order anybody around because she doesn't have that in her most of the time. But when she sees that he's breathing, um, she grabs Tyria and pulls her, her ear up to her face. And Tyria, who is a champion, just is like, all right, I'll let her do it. Let's go. And she hears it. Rosifus, seal the door. Nobody gets in. I don't know how he's held on this long and we're still running out of time, but do what you can to save his life. And what we find out, which makes sense, is that this armor is invested to save the emperor's life. And that's what it's doing. It's not making him come back to life or anything, but it's keeping him alive and just barely so that there is the possibility that they can save him. However, as we find out later when we are with Dalton Foster, the armor is keeping him alive in such a direct way that if they remove it to do any sort of surgery on him, it is not going to keep him alive any longer. It's preventing them from getting to vital parts of his body so that they can do anything. But it is not helping in the grander sense. So he's in the middle of, uh, of packing up his stuff. And he is thinking about the fact that he's bailing and wondering what everybody's going to do. He has heard that Calder's dead. He doesn't really believe it. Uh, he'd only believe the boy was dead three days after he buried the body himself, which is such a good line. I love that so much. Uh, Jerry could go rot in the, in the elder's void. Andal would be fine. Petal might be in some trouble. She'll be fine, he consoled himself. She's with the champions. She'll be safer than me. And it seems like he is still just going to go. And I was a little bit bummed about this. That he, All it takes is being like, oh, she'll probably be fine. And it looks like he was really going to leave. But... He's coming out and he runs into this little girl, Lotta, and she explains that Petal sent me to get to get you. Excuse me. Um, and he he says, once you're done with that, we have got uh, we have another stop. And then we go to Andal. This is so amusing. So Andal is talking to a merchant named Metz. And Metz deals in black market items, basically. 
All Andal is trying to do is buy some rice and some beans. What we find out, Andal had been hired on as part of a noble family's estate, and he'd found the staff in a pitiful state. Not a one of them had any idea how to stock a pantry or plan an event. They were about to throw a feast for some of the more influential visiting guild members, and the instructions they had given their servants were to, quote, buy some food, unquote. Which, I love this because, is this work a little beneath Andal's pay grade? Yes. But also, Andal being, like, the steward of a household feels very appropriate to his overall competence and how like how seriously he takes himself and usually when I say somebody takes themselves seriously it can mean maybe lighten up a little bit and I think has a nice balance though of being serious enough while also seeing the humor in moments so I do not mean that in any way as a bad thing for him um so he has come in here and he is like ready to uh, get this place into shape and they are lucky to have him. And in some ways I'm like, I wish that he could just stay doing this because they clearly really need him. But as it turns out, he is going to be sidelined. So first he's sidelined by Metz who keeps thinking that what Andal is really here for is a different, like what he's, when he says 20 pounds of lentils, Andal's like, was that a code or something? What is he doing? Because Metz starts out with, I can get you a baby chimera. You name the species. And he says, no, I just want this. All right. I can see you're a man of discriminating taste. Yes, indeed. And he pulls out this saber filled with the resentment of dead men and still spotted with the blood of Baldazar Kern himself. Half the flagstones in the Imperial Palace are spotted with Kern's blood, Andal thought, but he maintained a business-like smile. And he keeps being like, dude, no, I don't want this. And he go, the dude's like, all right, I got something better for you. And he goes in the back and Andal just yells after him, I hope it's rice. <laughs> so this guy is back there. Eventually, when he does come out, he's carrying... Uh, not only is this rice, but it's an ancient strain of alchemically enhanced chimera blessed. But at this point, Lada has come up to Andal and asked for his help. And he says to the guy, change of plans. I need one of these. I don't intend to ask any questions about where it came from. And I need it now. And Metz is like, fucking finally. Yes, I've got it. So... They go in to handle him. And then we have this conversation that I cannot stop laughing about. Calder's talking to the alchemists who are like, well, we have this uh, this theoretical potion that we could make that Petal has come up with that will have some long-term side effects. We don't know what it'll do. And Calder's like, he's going to fucking die, guys. He's going to die now. Like... What what long-term side effects do you think are going to be a bigger problem than just dying? And eventually, he just, like, grabs one of the guys and says, if any of you makes an excuse, instead of just working to save his life, it's going to be five lashes. I just wanted you to know, the man muttered, this is stressful for me, too. And then we've got Andal showing up. And I didn't get what was happening here. Andal takes out the medallion, uh, identical in shape to the one hanging on his chest. Unlike the one Andal wore, the silver of this one was tarnished and the diamond in the center pulsed with intent. Foster could feel it from a pace away. This white sun medallion yearned to right the world, to bring light and restoration to the darkest corners. It was a true beacon, a focus for the most powerful pilgrims. And I was wondering why the one Foster's wearing doesn't have intent in it and how he knew the one the guy had would have intent. I don't know. I'm I'm just curious about it because he has his own. Um, I don't know. I don't know. So... 
Foster taps it and says, you know, we can't use that without you. And basically goes through the whole and Andal has to be like, Dalton. Yes, I know. And we're going to do it. And Foster is just going to leave him to soul bind with it and is crossing his fucking fingers that it does something and that it actually works. But yeah, this is definitely, as we know, it's always a risk. I assume this is going to work. I really hope I'm right about that. Um, but that's kind of what I was wondering. Asher says, I wonder if it has to do with Andal's disillusionment with the Luminians. Same question. So fucking Calder wakes up in the sitting room and there is Kellerak, which is pretty much what I expected. And I am hopeful that Kellerak is going to be in the middle of trying to make a deal with him and Calder's friends are just going to save him and interrupt the conversation. I really hope that. Um, so then we go to 17. I only have like five minutes remaining, but this is four years ago. It's Dalton Foster's POV, but he had been with the whole crew already at this time. And the Testament basically dropped him off for like a two week stint and then was going to go pick him up. Now, out of curiosity, I went back to the moment where Akhmagut tells them each their like little, you know, truth in quotes, <laughs> truth asterisk. And he told Andal his family was gone and Andal's response was immediately, I am going to go find them because fuck you telling me they're gone. I'm not going to believe an elder's word for anything. And even if I did, I'm going to prove that you can be incorrect. It's just immediate full on defiance. Um, Asher says, Foster, you keep mixing up names today. Oh shit. Who did I say? Well, yes, I did mean Foster. You are correct. But he is here trapped by this guy who is apparently some kind of addict and also just a maniac with a pretty big band of people following him who have taken over his entire town. And the, the guy is holding Foster's entire family hostage in exchange for Foster making and an awakened gun, which is hugely difficult to do. And the reasons given make a lot of sense um, that they're basically small machines. So they have multiple parts, moving parts, which can make it really difficult because normally when you're soul binding, it's with one particular or not even soul binding, but just like investing something heavily. It's a particular uh, part that you bind with. And this is when it's multiple parts. How do you know what which part is, you know, and then awakening could transform the parts into a more aesthetically pleasing or powerful whole, but the parts could end up changing shape and working against each other mechanically. So the device might no longer function, which that is really tough. Um, yet he is pushing himself. We find out that it has been a week. He hasn't slept and he hasn't eaten the entire time. And I should have realized right away, based on the fragments of intent that he is investing it with, the fragments that he's using are all about justice and like righteous killing, that kind of thing. I should have realized immediately what it was he was setting up to do. Eventually I get there because he becomes pretty clear, you know, as, it, as this chapter goes on. But I should have realized like right away. Um, and eventually when he does the like final awakening, he passes out and he is woken up by this guy, Hereford Wells, who is the one that has uh, taken things over. And Wells has a woman who doesn't have a name. She's just called witch woman, 
read it on his behalf because he's a little bit like he's a little gun shy lol um but yeah he thinks that perhaps foster has put like a trap in there which is possible and he she says that this is a fucking work of art she's just like holy shit and the guy takes her word for it and is like hey i knew you could do it and all throughout awakened objects were complex to read and it took time to get to know them a cursory inspection usually wouldn't reveal much about its capabilities or nature he had been counting on it and i'm like "Ooh, bitch what do you got going on i'm thinking it's gonna like explode and take the man's hand off i don't know what i was thinking so this is when we find out that like they've been cutting pieces off all of his family members over the course of the week and there's a literal box that they've been tossing those parts into they they've taken off the tips of his son's tongues they've taken off five of his wife's ex-wife's fingers um and they haven't started yet on the grandchildren but it feels like it's kind of a matter of time at this point and i will be honest you guys I was like very eagerly listening to the first two chapters of this section. First three. I got here. I had to take a pause and come back to it the next day. It was so upsetting what was going on that I was just did not care for it. Um, So Wells gets the gun and like points it randomly at everybody in the room and is delighted when he sees them all shrink back and flinch. There's kind of a nice moment where Foster is looking around and realizing that all these people are also this man's prisoners in a way. And it's not excusing what they're doing, but it, I do appreciate the moment of realization of just like, man, I mean, I, guess they can't really get out of this either it's extremely different of course because they're still terrorizing others but uh yeah so this yeah asher says this chapter was fucking tough as gross as a lot of the series gets i think the scene was the most brutal to date i think it's the most brutal because like we kind of know where a lot of this is heading Or what, you know, like, we know how traumatized Foster is by this. And yet we didn't have a lot of the details or anything. So I was just kind of, oh, boy. I mean, I know that, like, nothing good really comes of this. I mean, what could? It just, there there wasn't a lot of hope. I, I know he makes it out. But I wasn't really sure what all happens to everybody else. And just Foster making it out, that's not great for Foster. You know, he doesn't really seem to even want that. Um, so finally, this fucking guy uh, is going to do the like initial shot on a couch The gun dragged Wells' hand up, pressing itself against his temple, and fired. He collapsed on the floor, and the gun, defying momentum, slid on the wood between two carpets and and rushed straight into Foster's hand. Even through his burned-out reader's senses, he could feel Oath to Eternity's glee. If he were soul bound to it, he might hear its voice as he distantly heard the voices of his tools from time to time. And he sees the other bandits and he pulls the trigger five times and they are all dead. And his family, instead of being like, thank you, I'm so glad you killed that guy, are thinking much more big picture and go, what are you doing? Now we're dead. We're definitely dead. Because... Wells is not the guy like, yeah, he's the one running things, but the whole town is run at this point by his gang. There's going to be some kind of hierarchy. There is going to be a power vacuum. Somebody's going to step in and they're going to make an example of the person who got rid of Wells. Like it's just, that's how it's going to work. And he knows that, but essentially what it seems to come down to is I would rather die fighting all of them than just watch you guys get picked apart piece by piece 
while I'm held hostage and as a slave. And I kind of see his point, you know, I mean, I get it. So he is, uh, looking through the slats at all of these people who have started to realize some shit is happening and they are like coming up to the door trying to get in. All of this, meanwhile, is punctuated by Foster's memories of how he has let his family down and he hasn't been welcome in this house for a long time because he put accumulating stuff and put his success ahead of his connection with them. So all of this, like his family is in danger, but they are not happy about him helping. They pretty much blame him entirely for what's going on with them at this point. And he is sort of like, they are wrong, actually. Um, he has to argue with his hammer to get it to do things because apparently his intent when he made it was all about only wanting to work on things that were sort of worthy art weapons so if it's used for anything mundane it doesn't really want to do it and he is just so annoyed with his past self and it never occurred to me that you could like invest your intent in something and then change so much as a person that your own intent fights you but that is very annoying i mean oh my god um so he's nailing all the doors shut and he sees something out a window and for a moment he just sort of like ignores it. And then he realizes what it is that he has seen and it's the Testament. And all of a sudden here's Urziah. Foster, you are a week late. The battle was over. A champion was here. Urzaya pulled the secured door off its hinges with one hand, tearing it apart like it was made of sticks and string. The huge man looked down on Foster, his blue eyes kind, smiling his gap-tooth smile. A bullet slammed into his back, ricocheted off, and bit into the ceiling. Oh my god. And he says, do not worry, Foster. We are here now. I will take you home. Foster passed out. And that's the end of the chapter. So I'm very interested to see exactly what happens with his family past this point. But, uh, uh, I mean, there's an entire town to deal with, you know, I, I, I want to know what happens to all of them also, but I'm out of time. So I better wrap. Um, so thank you again, Asher, for commissioning this. Thank you to everybody who is listening. Hope you're enjoying it. And until next week. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.